So we've just um, opened the meeting. We actually haven't opened the meeting, announced that it's the meeting. Um, and I'm looking for public comment. I don't see anyone here for public comment. Um, all right, we'll close that. Um, would someone like to make a motion to open our Board of Health meeting? Uh, move to open the meeting. Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. And myself, Joanne? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so we'll start with uh, Vivian. Thank you again, Viv, for uh, providing us with some data. All right, can you see my screen? We can. And this time I checked my microphone before we started, so I shouldn't be muffled. You're good to go. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so current COVID trends uh, in Northampton. In the past seven days, we had a whopping 55 new cases, which sounds like a lot. Um, but if you remember, I think at the last meeting we had, it was like 200 new cases in the past seven days. So we're way down. Um, incidence rate is uh, 27 average cases per day per 100,000 people and a seven day case rate of 188 new cases per 100,000 in seven days. That's an 11% decrease from the previous seven days. Um, Hospitalizations and deaths, as we know, lag behind cases. So we did have greater than zero, but fewer than five hospitalizations and deaths in the past seven days. Um, in Hampshire County, we had 218 new cases. That's equivalent to the case rate of 136 cases per 100,000. Um, last week, our transmission finally went below that threshold that puts us in the medium, but at the same time, our hospitalizations had crept up and surpassed that 10 admissions per 100,000. So we stayed in the medium last week. This week, um, today we're looking at uh, 6.4 new admissions per 100,000. So I kind of think that was just a blip. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers that that stays um, where it's at and we end up in the low community level for tomorrow um, for the past seven days. We had a 36% decrease in hospitalization. So again, I'm crossing my fingers. 4.2% um, of our staff and patient beds are filled by COVID positive patients and we had fewer than 10 new deaths in Hampshire County in the past seven days. So that's low with an asterisk. I'm hoping that stays the same um, for when we uh, get that map published likely either later tonight or um, tomorrow it'll be published and updated. Um, our community transmission risk though no notably is still high. Um, it's still above that mark of 100 cases per 100,000 in seven days. So um, while the community level is low based on a combination of the transmission and hospitalizations, um, our transmission risk is still high. Um, as you can see in this graph here too, uh, our cases are trending downward and we really haven't seen um, a tremendous amount of, uh, a tremendous um, amount of deaths during this previous surge and that is notable. Um, okay, so wastewater surveillance. Uh, this is as of June 15th. Um, so we did see a 2.4% increase in our wastewater levels between June 8th and June 15th. Um, that is something to keep an eye on. Uh, it's not a you know, substantial increase, but it's also not a decrease. Um, on that note, our variant proportions are important to look at right now. Um, as you probably heard, BA.4 and BA.5, um, which have similar mutations, are the new subvariants of concern um, under the Omicron variants. They are sweeping the globe in a dramatic way um, and contributing to a rise in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, they are more transmissible than the BA.2.1.2.1 and the BA.2. Um, it's unclear if they're more severe, but as we know, when a variant is more transmissible and escaping our immune defenses, um, that's something to watch out for because just the increase in volume can lead to an increase in deaths and hospitalizations. Um, it's also hard for us to model what's going to happen in the United States with these off of other geographies because, um, for example, like the United States had BA.2 um, and BA.2.1.1 caused these 
massive surge in infection pretty recently. So we as a population could have a pretty recent um, uh, infection induced immunity um, that could protect us from severe outcomes with the surge. So it's really hard to predict what's gonna happen here, but probably we are gonna see another increase in cases. It's unclear though, if that's gonna translate to um, severe outcomes though. Oh, that was a mouthful. Any questions about that? Okay, so Dr. Levin also supplied some graphs here um, that I think she wants to say a little bit about. Yeah, it's just, <clears throat> I think of wastewater as our early sign, you know, obviously, you know, hospitalizations or deaths are a late sign. Um, and wastewater is an early sign and, and it looked like our trend was coming down and just started to plateau. And the question is whether we're going to be on the rise again very soon. And I think that will, that information is going to affect our next discussion. So I think it was important to note. And as BA4 and BA5 rise around the globe, uh, it seems to be behaving differently in different settings, depending on uh, what they had happening what they have had happen recently. So for example, Portugal is a very highly vaccinated state. Um, and even though they had a BA2 wave, um, they are having a big BA4, B, B, uh, BA5 wave. It's not clear yet what is gonna happen in other um, European countries, for example, and what's gonna happen in the US, but it looks like things are just starting to go up in other places. Um, South Africa did have a, a significant bump um, with these variants. And I think I have one more slide. You do. Yeah, so this is um, a graph of admissions, admissions to the hospital in England that's now having this BA4 and BA5. And so zero means uh, admissions were, were unchanged. This is a graph of change. Um, and so the rate of change of admissions is continuing to go up. So a 40% rate of change apparently translates into a doubling of the hospitalizations every two weeks. So um, right now, if, at least from my reading, it's unclear whether BA4 and BA5 will cause a surge. And if they cause a surge, whether it causes more severe disease, more hospitalizations and deaths. So it, you know, each variant has its own profile of what kind of disease it causes. And there are some questions about whether this is just gonna be another um, less severe Omicron variant, or this will be more like Delta, um, a little more severe disease than we've been seeing um, with the other, yeah. other Omicrons. Joanne? Yeah. Is this graph um, COVID-related admissions, COVID-detected admissions, or overall hospitalizations? Oh, I think, I think this is admitted with or for COVID. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's, I believe so. And do we know what the baseline rate was? Well, this is um, decline in growth. So zero change would be there's, it's a stable rate of hospitalization. I can't, this is not about number. I know right. this graph is sort of funky that way. So if you're right. below zero, you're, you're decreasing. And if you're above zero, you're increasing. And this is the rate of increase. Right, I, I understood that, but I was saying if it was a low starting point, then 10 or 20 percent growth Wouldn't may so. not be that significant a number. Yeah. I'm just curious. Good point. Good point. No, I'm not sure about that. Thank you so much, Vivian. Anybody have any other questions about the data? Thank you. Oh, I don't have any questions about data, but I do want to acknowledge this is probably Vivian's last Board of Health meeting. She is leaving the department July 15th is her last date. Um, I know, which is very sad. And we haven't been able to find a replacement, unfortunately. We've only had two people apply for the job, and we've posted on every platform, every you know public health uh, agency that we can think of, and two applicants. So not sure where that, yeah, what's going to happen with that. But we do have Kate to, you know, still continue with clinic work and hopefully be able to fulfill some of Vivian's roles. But just wanted to give an opportunity for you all to say goodbye and thank you to Vivian for everything that she's done. Oh, Vivian, what a loss. Yeah. Uh, I wish you the very, very best, but my heart's broken. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, ditto as well, Vivian. Thank you so much for being the wonk that you are with data. It's so appreciated. Um, hope you're going on to wonderful things. I, I just met you, but I've been very impressed by all <laughs> the presentations and data, and um, I, I will, I will miss it. <laughs> And I've already told you how much we're going to miss you. Um, it's just been great working with you. I mean, I've worked with you through the hospital as well as through the Board of Health. It's just been, you've been fabulous. So, well, I know you'll do well wherever you go. Thank you. I didn't prepare a speech or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't realize this was your last meeting, did you? I, I don't know. To be honest, the years kind of snuck up on me, so. Yeah, time's moving in a very yeah. strange way. <laughs> Vivian, tell them what great things you're going to, going to do. Oh, well, I'm returning to school to get my master's in nursing to be a family nurse practitioner. So I'm starting that at the end of summer. So I'll be finishing here and hopefully taking a nice break before that, but I'm sure I'll be stressing and prepping. <laughs> Where will you be going, Vivian? Um, I'll be going to Yale University School of Nursing. Okay. Good for you. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Viv. And you know how much I love you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I just have to ask, we will still be getting um, on the website the weekly updates on Thursday. BPH or on our website? On our website. The dashboard? Yeah, Vivian's the only one that knows how to do that right now. So unclear. We'll have to figure something out. I am putting together many tutorials. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a TBD. TBD. To be determined. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so our next item is, um, I see Josh is here. Welcome, Josh. Um, we're just going to do a little old business and then we'll get to our talk. Um, old business to review the mask advisory that we put in on May 25th. Um, and that advisory said that our community transmission level was high and recommended that everyone um, mask in public settings. Um, any thoughts about? This advisory. I, I guess I would say, I mean, um, I, um, I think we should continue it if that's the question on the table um, based on the stats. Um, I'm not sure how widely it's disseminated. Um, and um, I would just throw out when we do something like this, we might want to access, um, for example, the emergency response system, um, some other, you know, vehicles um, to communicate this. I mean, I, I, I know people who have heard of it. I know people who haven't heard of it. And so it's, um, it's not quite a policy. It may be policy light, but I think it's important that it, it uh, reaches all the, um, the publics in, in the city. Um, I guess I was on the fence about whether we would downgrade our advisory, it's sort of a CDC framework is that at the highest level, you ask everyone to mask, at the medium level, you suggest that people are immune compromised or, or have a particular risk um, mask. And based on our wastewater, I was watching the levels go down and down and down, uh, but now it's sort of stabilized and we have this BA4 and BA5 potentially in front of us. So rather than changing things and having to change back, I thought it was reasonable to wait another few weeks and see where we're going before making a change. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, that, that seems reasonable to me. I, I just, Suzanne, did you, were you gonna say something? I'm sorry. I was not. Oh, okay, I, I just um, just want to challenge us on this. Um, we, we use the term at risk a lot. 
and we sort of, um, for COVID purposes, leave that to the immunocompromised and the elderly. And I just want to remember that health disparities, including COVID, go across many different demographics. And so um, as we tune into this, you know, who's at risk and, and we're sort of been guided by CDC, et cetera. Um, there's many unknown individuals who are at risk and I don't wanna forget about them um, and what that means because of the demographic or socioeconomic condition that they're in. Um, so I just wanna highlight that. Thank you for reminding us of that. <clears throat> Any other thoughts or comments about this mask advisory? I don't think we need to take a vote unless someone has something they want to vote on. And if I don't hear a motion, I'll assume that we'll leave things as is. Okay, great. Um, it's 10 of <laughs> Is that me echoing? No, sorry, that was me. Oh, you're on to. Uh, I had to. Yeah, to the connection videos. was really unstable, so I went on my phone. Do you want to turn off your other one? I did. Is it still okay. echoing? Your video's still up. That's from my phone, I think. It's a video of you looking at your phone. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um. So it does not appear we have a lot of visitors. Um, so I wonder if we should just go ahead. Um, we had invited people to come for six o'clock um, discussion of ventilation, but it sounds like most of the people we invited have an alternative meeting at this time. Um, so I think we could probably go ahead and the um, a, Link to a similar video presentation will be up on the Board of Health website. Amy, where specifically would you put that? On the Board of Health? Oh, you're, you're, you're muted. I was thinking I was gonna put it under the health of the Department of Health and Human Resources under environmental Dep division. Um, okay. With things like Cyanobacteria, fresh air, you know, healthy buildings, things like that, more environmental. Okay. Right. Thank you. All uh, right. Amy, Amy, can it be listed in more than one place? It certainly can. I mean, can it be listed on the general Department of Health and Human Services uh, webpage because it's a new topic and, okay. and people might not have the patience to search through yeah. the, the entire site to try to find it. Right, right. Absolutely. We have on the main page, it'll be like what's new or current events and stuff like that. So it'll be mm -hmm. listed under there. And then I'm Perfect. sure it's something that the mayor will push out also. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, so maybe we'll get started. Welcome, Josh. Uh, do you want to put on your camera? You don't have to. <laughs> but if you want to say hi to everybody. Um, and um, <clears throat> so um, Josh, Amy, and I, in addition to Rick Peltier, who is a professor um, of uh, air quality at UMass, uh, constituted the uh, ventilation task force at the Department of Health. Um, and we have put together um, a presentation uh, sort of explaining the why and how of improving ventilation in indoor spaces. Um, so um, thanks, Josh, for, oh, let's see. Oh, Josh needs to be made a, uh, needs to be made a co-host or something, right? Is that the problem? There you go. You're on, Josh. You're unmuted. Uh, I can't start my video. It says the the host has stopped it. Sorry, we have <laughs> some rules for our for our meetings to avoid getting a uh, zoom bombed and things like sure. that. <laughs> but we'll make you a co-host.
There you there go. go. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi there. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to help uh, Joanne give this presentation. So are you prepared to share your slides? Absolutely. All right. And okay. if you prefer, Joanne, uh, for your section, you could mm. share screen. And then when we transition, I could share screen if you would rather have control over your slides. No, that's OK. I'll let you do it okay. all if you're Great. comfortable with that. Sure. Uh, let me this. All right, great. can you see that okay? Yeah, great, thank great. you. Absolutely. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, healthy indoor air. And as I said, uh, Amy, Josh, uh, Rick and I have worked together. We met every week or two um, to try to decide what the, our priorities were and to try to improve uh, indoor air in Northampton. And we decided to start with education. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, so why, what, what's important in our world where some of the things that, that have been, uh, we've concentrated on as a society is clean water. Um, and I can't remember what the next picture is. <laughs> and so uh, it's uh, important that we talk about air and we're used to talking about air pollution in the outdoor setting, um, but we uh, now really need to concentrate uh, more on um, air quality in the indoor setting. And why is this important? Well, because indoor air can spread germs and diseases, particulates, and VOCs. Josh, can you tell me, remind me what VOCs are? Volatile oh, organic compounds. So things like paint fumes, um, sometimes furniture will off gas these, uh, this stuff. Basically fumes, you can think of it as. Right. Um, so we're going to focus really more on the diseases, COVID, COVID um, but flu and RSV are other respiratory diseases that may be better controlled also with improved indoor air quality. So how is COVID transmitted? Next slide. Um, so in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of attention on the droplet mode of transmission, those larger uh, particles uh, of water and virus um, travels on these particles. And uh, we're thinking about transmission from person to person. You get a cough done, sneezed on, or someone's talking or whatever it is. Um, it's that direct transmission that we talk about three to six feet. That's where the sort of six feet rule comes from because we're thinking about direct transmission from person to person. And this is where social distancing uh, concept came from that if you're further away, you might not get exposed to those particles. We know that's actually the six feet is not really correct, um, that some particles can travel even further up to 10 or 12 feet. Um, but we do know that masks are effective in decreasing the number of droplets, maybe not by 100%, but uh, significantly. However, uh, we also learned a little bit later in the pandemic as time went by um, that some other things were going on. So this is a choral rehearsal, next slide. So if you remember, this happened uh, very, pretty early on in early March. This is a Skagit Valley choir outbreak. This is in, um, uh, in the Northwest. There were 61 people who, acquired, uh, who uh, attended the choir uh, practice. And 87% um, of them developed COVID after they, uh, three were hospitalized and two died. After they studied this, they found that there was one member who had flu-like symptoms a few days before. And this, you remember this was a time when there were not, not, was not a lot of testing happening, but that person was tested and did have COVID. Um, so this was two and a half hours of it being in one room. It's not a tiny room. There were no masks. We didn't wear, weren't wearing masks at that point in the pandemic. People were sitting closely together, um, but the cases were broadly spread out through the room. There was no clustering by seat location. Um, and the air change rate was estimated to be quite low. So there is less than one air changes per hour, which means the air was, the air was rather stale, right? It wasn't moving. In the hospital, our basic um, um, air changes per hour for just a regular exam room is six air changes per hour. 
Um, so this brought up the question of what are the roots of COVID transmission? And it's not just contact. And it brought up the question of aerosols and airborne to be it's sort of the same idea of smaller particles that float in the air and can travel long distances. Josh, you can click one more time. Um, and that really uh, is a way that um, this disease can be transmitted in particularly in indoor air, uh, quite long distances. Next slide. So here's another example um, of a cluster of infections on a poorly ventilated bus. So this happened in China. They were going to an outdoor ceremony. Uh, several groups uh, were traveling in different ways. Um, two groups traveled by bus and others went by private transportation. They traveled for about an hour and a half. The ceremony was closer to two hours. The ceremony was outdoors. But on board, bus number one, there was a patient, they looked back, who uh, was carrying COVID. 53% of the people on that bus uh, became infected. On bus number two, there was no, um, no known person who was infected. No one got COVID. And on private transportation, there were a few people who did get infected, but all of them had close contact with the index patient at the ceremony. So it was outdoors, but they had close contact. And so this bus apparently did not bring in fresh air and a lot of air conditioning systems don't bring fresh air, they just recirculate the air. They may cool the air and recirculate, but not clean it. And so you can see the, um, the red square, the red rectangle is the infected person. The orange rectangles are people who got infected and they were distributed all over that bus. Um, but the people who were closest had two modes of transmission. They had droplet and airborne and there was a 42% um, transmission rate. And the people who were further away um, was a 20, had a 26% uh, infection rate. And that, in my mind, is still very high. Um, and um, so it was not limited to just the people within six feet. And then we have another uh, example. Um, and and uh, the other thing to remember is this the, is the original version of COVID. This is when one COVID case infected two or three other people on average. Now with Omicron, the average, you know, it's so much more transmissible that one Omicron patient can infect eight to 12 other people. So now we're dealing with a much more um, transmissible virus. So we have to put that in context. Um, but here's uh, another example. Um, you have the patient A1 with a little uh, yellow circle. Um, who uh, had COVID and all the other people in the red circles got infected. Um, and um, some of the infected diners were up 12 feet away. And you see all the way on the right is an air conditioner. This air conditioner re recirculated air. So there was an air current making a circle. Next slide, please. Sort of taking in air and putting out air. Um, and so many people in that air current got infected. Um, and the other people didn't get infected quite so much because there, that air was not being transmitted over to the other side of the room. Um, but the attack rate in the area with the air conditioner um, was 45%. Um, so the take home, I think, from these examples is that aerosol transmission may occur under conditions of poor ventilation. <clears throat> and it <clears throat> happens less so in, in the outdoor um, in outdoors because the air can just sort of whisk away and dilute um, the virus and you have fresh air sort of coming into your airspace. Uh, but in the indoor space, you don't have that. Next slide. Um, so it took a while uh, for the World Health Organization and the CDC to actually write it on their websites and really accept the fact that <clears throat> COVID is uh, spread by the airborne route. And personally, I think that the World Health Organization took a while because it had so many ramifications uh, to interventions that people would do um, around the world. I mean, open, opening windows is one thing, um, but increasing ventilation just seemed undoable, I think, in lots of countries. So they were really dragging their feet on um, accepting the fact that this is an airborne disease. Um, but now they do accept that. 
Um, and the CDC as well on their website now uh, acknowledges that indoors, the concentration of viral particles is higher than outdoors. When indoors, ventilation mitigation strategies can help reduce viral particle concentration and protective ventilation practices and interventions can reduce the airborne concentrations and reduce overall viral dose to occupants. So it, um, it is important part uh, of what we can do in public health to decrease transmission of this disease. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, in March, the EPA put out a, uh, this clean air in buildings challenge, um, and it, it encourages folks to have an action plan to how to uh, clean their air. This is just the first page of it. It goes on for several pages, but it ex uh, explains um, what it means and, and how to go about um, uh, including cleaning one's air. So this just came out a few weeks ago. This was an, uh, from the MMWR, which is the publication from the CDC that showed that schools that um, implemented, the, they say, higher cost strategies. That means replacing um, the filters in your HVAC or using HEPA filters as opposed to just using windows, decreased their COVID transmission in their schools by around 30, 30%. Um, so there is data to show that it works. So what do we, how does that translate to what we might do in Northampton? Um, so I think improving air quality in restaurants and bars and other public areas is a real win for public health and for businesses. Um, it can be effective. It's not person dependent. Um, it's generally invisible to diners. It's not going to piss anybody off. No one's going to be asking them to, you know, wear a mask or show a Vax card. Um, Promoting the fact that they have good ventilation could increase patronage. Um, so I think it's a real win-win. Next slide. So I think the part that restaurants would be most excited about is not having to ask people to mask when they come in or not having, you know, anything that that they would have to impose on their, their patrons. Um, and then there's the question of, will it improve uh, safety and health for the workers? Would it um, make it so that there's, they have less sick leave, uh, more productivity? Uh, it would just be good for not only the patrons, but also the workers. I'm going to hand it off to Josh for the next part. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanne. Uh, so uh, we've talked about so far kind of uh, why we should care about indoor air quality. And so for my half of the presentation, I'm going to dive into how. Um, so there are basically three ways that you can improve your air quality indoors. First, we have ventilation. And ventilation is basically taking fresh air from the outside and bringing it into your building and then removing contaminated air from your building. Second, we have filtration. Filtration is basically taking the air inside of your building and passing it through a filter that will clean that air. Uh, and then we have disinfection, which basically is a method to kill microbes in the air. So I'm gonna take these one by one. I'm gonna go through each and explain them a little bit more. So first we have ventilation here. As I said before, you're bringing fresh air in and you're removing your contaminated air. Uh, in fair weather, uh, it's pretty simple to improve your ventilation at least a little bit. Um, you can open windows, you can open doors, um, and as long as you uh, have something open to the outside, you can set up fans to encourage airflow and improve your ventilation within your building. Um, restaurants in particular would need to make sure that their windows and other openings are screened um, so that insects don't um, enter and get into the kitchen and the food and uh, uh, mess up people's day in that way. Um, but in fair weather, this is uh, a no cost and already pretty effective strategy. Um, buildings with central HVAC have more options. Um, uh, many central HVAC systems will have uh, vents that will allow for intake of clean air from the outside. Um, not all of these systems have that turned on by default necessarily. Um, so it's important for business owners and landlords to check with their HVAC technicians uh, to make sure that their HVAC is actually bringing in fresh air from the outside um, and to maximize that to the extent 
um, that makes sense for them in terms of energy efficiency. Um, but the more fresh air that you can bring in from the outside through your HVAC system, the better your ventilation is going to be in your building. Um, other sources of ventilation uh, in uh, indoor spaces, especially in businesses, are um, bathroom and kitchen exhaust fans. Um, so as long as these are, you know, functioning properly, um, you know, these will provide other sources of ventilation for these spaces. Uh, kitchen exhaust hoods in particular have very high flow rates and provide quite effective ventilation uh, in the immediate area. They certainly shouldn't be used as the main method of ventilation, but they provide useful additions to, to a ventilation plan. Uh, one important tool to help um, assess your ventilation is carbon dioxide monitors. Um, so there are many high quality, relatively inexpensive carbon dioxide monitors that are available um, to, to be purchased now. Um, and basically, you know, this will tell you what the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air in your space is. And the reason that that is important is because carbon dioxide is a proxy for how good your ventilation is in that space. So the more you're bringing in fresh air from the outside, the more you're removing indoor air, the more um, your carbon dioxide indoors is going to look like carbon dioxide outdoors. So as your number drops, um, toward um, the atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, concentration of about 400 parts per million, the better ventilated your space is. And generally, um, a space is considered to be well ventilated if uh, the carbon dioxide concentration is below about 1100 parts per million. So with one number, you can get a pretty good sense of how well ventilated your space is which will tell you how much effort you really need to put into other mitigation methods. So if you're not getting good ventilation, you will need to redouble your efforts on filtration uh, and other methods for making that indoor space um, have clean air. Um, but if you do have good ventilation, then you know you're off to a good start in terms of keeping people inside healthy and happy. Uh, so second, I'm gonna talk about filtration. Um, and so as a reminder, filtration is basically a device uh, that physically removes um, harmful particles from the air. Um, so we are passing contaminated air into the filter and cleaner air is coming out of it. Um, first, I wanna talk a little bit about central HVAC systems. Um, so many central HVAC systems um, support uh, these filters called MERV rated filters. Um, so MERV filters are basically um, rated and the higher the rating is, the smaller um, particles it can filter out. So at a, Mer at a lower MERV rating, something like MERV 6, it's gonna filter out larger particles like lint and pollen and dust. And then as you move up the MERV ratings, um, it, it's going to filter out smaller and smaller particles and once you get up to MERV 13, um, it starts to get effective at filtering um, many forms of bacteria and viruses um, like the novel coronavirus. Um, so upgrading your central HVAC systems filter to a higher MERV rating uh, is an important way to filter the air in your space. Um, however, not all central HVAC systems can support higher MERV ratings. So it's, this isn't something that you should try yourself um, if you have a central HVAC system. Um, this is something that you should really ask an HVAC, HVAC technician about. They will be able to tell you what rate MERV rating uh, your, your uh, HVAC system can support, and they will help you change that filter. Um, likewise, um, once you have a good filter, uh, you, know, you still need to replace your filter on a regular schedule. An old filter is really not going to be as effective in terms of filtration. Um, and most HVAC filters recommend that they get replaced every three months. This is not true for every single um, HVAC filter, but this is the most common replacement schedule. So just make sure that these are, are getting replaced on, on time. Uh, now, another option for filtration 
um, especially if you don't have the capacity to filter your air through a central HVAC system, is by using standalone HEPA filters. Um, and so these are, there are many, many options available on the market now uh, in terms of uh, quality HEPA filters, um, uh, ranging from ones that will filter out air around your desk to big rooms. So that comes in big, big and small sizes. Um, and so uh, purchasing and placing standalone HEPA filters, um, especially if you don't have a central HVAC filter, uh, can be quite effective at filtration as long as you uh, have them uh, placed uh, correctly and you have um, enough uh, filtration capacity. Um, they're also relatively inexpensive. A reasonably sized standalone HEPA filter now only costs a couple hundred dollars. Um, so they're getting quite inexpensive and they are extremely effective at filtration. Uh, so if, depending upon the size of your space um, and the height of your ceilings, you may need to purchase multiple of these HEPA filters to filter your entire space. Um, and there's really two ways you can figure out um, your HEPA filter requirements. Um, the simple way on the left is area coverage. And this is just literally you measure the length and width of the rooms in your, in your building and you add them up and that's it. You just get a square footage um, and that will tell you uh, how many um, HEPA filters you need. Uh, because when you go to look at the information that HEPA filters advertise, they will give you a square footage coverage um, for, for how, how, how much square footage they can cover as a filter. Um, now, a better way to figure out your needs, especially if you have very tall ceilings, is by figuring out the clean air delivery rate that you need. Um, and so this just has a, a little bit of extra work over the simple way. Uh, first, you just measure your square footage as before. Uh, then you measure your ceiling height and you multiply your square footage by your ceiling height. Finally, you just divide by 15 and this will give you the clean air delivery rate that you need. Uh, and so just like the area coverage before, when you go to look at your at HEPA filters um, and, and look at their ratings, uh, any good HEPA filter will also tell you it's clean air delivery rate. And so if you want the best, uh, to be absolutely sure that you're covering your space, I'd recommend calculating your clean air delivery rate. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have an especially large space, you may need to buy multiple filters. Um, and the way you figure out what you need is just add up the cleaner delivery rates of those filters. There's nothing fancy that you have to do. You just add those up and make sure that that number is higher than your needs for your cleaner delivery rate. So finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about disinfection. Um, and so disinfection is basically, you're cleaning the air specifically of microbes by killing them. So we're not trapping particles, we're, we're killing microbes in this case. And generally, the way that disinfection devices work is that they use ultraviolet radiation. Um, so basically, air will pass through um, a, a vent or other device that has UV light um, shining in it. Um, and uh, as long as the air uh, is in that space for long enough, that UV light will kill uh, many microbes in that air. Um, these devices do require professional installation. Um, they can be dangerous if not set up by a professional um, for reasons you can imagine. UV light um, can give you sunburns and cause other problems. Um, they tend to be more expensive than, um, than for example, HVAC filters, um, and they only kill microbes. They don't really do much to address particulates and box. Um, they're really targeted more toward microbes. So they have some disadvantages uh, versus the other methods, but disinfection is another method that you can put in your toolbox um, as you're looking at improving your indoor air quality. Uh, so now that I've talked about um, methods for improving your indoor air quality, I just want to go through a few points of hygiene theater. 
And so hygiene theater is basically this idea that there are um, things that we have, um, uh, m methods that we've picked up uh, during the pandemic of trying to make our spaces safer, but that require quite a lot of effort for fairly low return. Um, and even in some cases can be counterproductive. So I just wanna highlight a few of those things as we're finishing up, um, because we really want to focus our time and energy and our money on methods that are most effective. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is plexiglass barriers. Um, so, you know, from, from the beginning of the pandemic, we basically saw a lot of plexiglass barriers coming up um, in our indoor spaces. And the original reasoning for that is sound. Um, plexiglass barriers basically act as barriers for droplets between people. So if you're standing in front of somebody and they're speaking at you, for example, a plexiglass barrier will block some of those droplets um, uh, coming out of the other person's mouth. Um, so this can be quite effective when they're placed, say, in front of a cashier or in front of a receptionist, basically somebody that's interacting with a lot of people throughout the day, um, and it's very one-to-one -one contact. Um, however, what I wanna point out is that uh, the more plexiglass barriers that you set up in a space, uh, the more that can interfere with ventilation in your space. Um, the more barriers there are, basically the more barriers there are, not just to you know, droplets between people, but also just to airflow. And so if you're trying to ventilate your space, putting up a lot of plexiglass barriers all throughout your indoor space can start to become counterproductive. So these are effective for shielding cashiers and receptionists and people who are getting a lot of contact from a lot of people one-to-one, -one. Um, but just be prudent about how many you set up because they can interfere with ventilation. Uh, the second thing that I want to talk about um, is uh, fancy filters or, or other devices. So um, there are quite a few different kinds of filters and um, air cleaning devices out there that are advertised with all kinds of fancy sounding technologies using plasmas and ozones, ionizers and free radicals. Um, and you pretty much can ignore this stuff. Um, most of these technologies are not going to be better than the filtration um, technologies that I described before, HEPA and high-rated MERV filters. Um, and in some cases, these can actually be more harmful than beneficial. Uh, specifically, I want to point out ozone um, as a potential harm. Uh, some devices use ozone um, to clean the air, but by releasing ozone, um, you can trigger conditions and exacerbate conditions such as asthma and other lung problems. So you're really, you're, you might be helping a little bit in one way, but you're also adding something to the air that is itself an air pollutant. Um, so I would say stick to the basics, get a HEPA filter, improve your MERV ratings in your central HVAC if you can, but don't worry about this other stuff. Um, it, it's mostly a distraction, and sometimes it can be harmful. Uh, the next thing that I want to point out is that uh, for your filters to clean your air, they need to be running. Um, and so on its face, this seems pretty obvious, right? Like a filter needs to be running in order to do anything. Um, but the specific point that I want to drive home here is that a lot of filters have what's called a smart mode or an auto mode. And basically what this means is the filter only turns on when it senses, in many cases, particulate. So larger particulates in the air, um, sometimes uh, called PM 2.5, um, this kind of particulate is often what standalone HEPA filters are looking for uh, in order to turn on. But these filters can't sense smaller particles such as bacteria or viruses. And so if you have one of these set on a smart mode, then even if you have, say, coronavirus in the air, it's not actually going to turn on. Um, so in order for these filters to do a good job at filtering viruses and bacteria, they really just need to be turned on, not a smart mode or an auto mode, just turned on. Um, so. Uh, definitely take that into account as you're setting up your filters. 
Uh, the final thing, and this is a reiteration of, uh, of Joanne's point earlier about air, filter, air circulation, just circulating air in your space isn't going to help you. Uh, and in fact, can sometimes be harmful by spreading around um, viruses, bacteria, or other harmful particles. Um, what you need is fresh or filtered air. So improving your ventilation, improving your filtration, and adding disinfection are all methods of uh, getting clean air in your space, but just moving air around is not sufficient and can actually be harmful. Um, so if you've watched this presentation and you still need help, um, we're going to be releasing an air quality help sheet and flowchart on the um, uh, Department of Health uh, website. Um, and so basically this will give you a sense of the options um, for ways that you can improve air quality in your space. Um, and if you feel like you've you know, understood everything and you've implemented these steps and you wanna go one step further, um, I would point you again to look up the Clean Air and Buildings Challenge that was released by the EPA. Um, this is a very comprehensive um, list of um, ways to generate an action plan for clean air, um, all the different ways that you can improve your air quality. You know, it talks about all the methods that we talked about here and more, um, and it gives plenty of um, other excellent resources to help you out. So I would recommend that if you want to go to the next level. Uh, and that's it. Um, you know, uh, some of what we talked about today relates specifically to businesses, um, but really these principles apply in any indoor space. Um, and so filtering your indoor air in your house, ventilating, you know, these are all good things to take into account in your homes as well. So because you, uh, you know, there's nothing better than uh, a breath of fresh air when you're at home. So thank you so much for uh, for listening and uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions for uh, Joanne or, or me or both of us. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, anybody have any questions? Um, do you want to take down the slide so we can see each other a little bit better? Thank you. Um, so this is the presentation that we thought we would bring through the Chamber of Commerce, the Downtown Business Association to um, Amy, I can't remember the name of the group that uh, educates other uh, departments of health um, in Hampshire County. It's a coalition. Uh, it's like HP, HPC, something like that. But it's uh, the surrounding co communities, um, public health directors that get together and they do um, emergency preparedness and they meet, they meet regularly, but they meet annually. And we thought that that would be a good place to bring that to. Actually, Actually we could share this. We're having, um, so we have 17 communities that are part of our public health excellence grant, Joanne, also. Mm -hmm. And we're having our uh, year end meeting coming up in person meeting. So I think this would be a really great opportunity to show this presentation there also. Um, sure. I with Lauren, and that's the same meeting in oh. September that we're trying to link into. And, and okay. Lauren says it's a, a, a great idea. She would just follow up with the, the exact where and when. Great. Um, any questions about the content or, um, or recommendations on where we might bring this? I, I Thank you so much, Joshua and, and Joanne, for doing this. And I think um, I'm thinking in terms of the businesses with my first question, and that is, um, can we ballpark a cost, um, say, for a 3,000 square foot um, uh, building, restaurant, whatever? Can we can we give some kind of a number to that? Yes. Um, generally, you know, for so let's take 3,000 as an example. For a space like that, um, uh, a reasonably large um, portable HEPA filter will cover somewhere around six to 700 square feet. And those will usually run about $200 for something like 3,000. So for something like 3,000 square feet, um, that would be, you know, around a thousand, maybe a little bit above a thousand if you're going the, the portable HEPA filter route, which 
are effective. Portable HEPA filters, you know, they work very well. Um, you know, if somebody wants to revamp their entire HVAC system, that's going to run a lot more. Um, but it could be as cheap as a few, you know, a few hundred dollars if, for example, all they need to do is upgrade the MERV rating on their central filters. Um, so there's a little bit of a range, but I would say usually between a few hundred and a bit over a thousand dollars. And it seems like you're talking a lot about traditional air conditioning systems when I'm seeing a lot of restaurants have a mini split option. Um, so will this work for that particular type of system as well? Well, they're separate systems generally. So uh, a mini split or air conditioners are, will, most of them are only recirculating air. Some of them do, some mini splits do have an option to bring in fresh air, but I'm not aware that it's especially common, um, but filters, so HEPA filters would be set up in addition to those, you know, it, they're, they're just separate devices that you would set up. Like, um, likewise, um, yeah, so if you have splits or window ACs or anything like that, um, and you don't have a central HVAC system, yeah, you would be setting up um, portable HEPA filters, yep. Thank you. Um, thank you. Joshua and uh, Joanne, this was great. It was, uh, there's a there's a lot of science behind what you presented. It was, if I can understand it, it must be really understandable. Um, I I don't know if we're in a situation where if we put it out there, they will come. I think that we need to put this into the context of why, why we have this interest. It's, it's because of the pandemic. Um, but people are so over this, especially um, put upon business owners who went into the hole over the past couple of years and barely got by, especially restaurants and bars. So um, I, I fear that this will, people will just dismiss this as, oh, there goes the Board of Health again, um, you're telling us something else to do. And I wonder how we can actually help rather than telling people what to do. Um, how we can help people do this. It seems to me that there are costs in assessment. I, I don't expect the, the uh, usual, first of all, most of the bar and restaurant owners don't own their buildings. Um, there's, they don't own, the, a, a landlord owns the buildings and all they know is, 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 the, is the space hot enough or, or is it too cold? Um, that's their concern. Uh, so I, I think that, we need to find ways to help people do assessments. We need to um, find ways to help people to weigh their options. And I think we need to find ways to provide equipment in a manner that's fair. And I don't have an answer to that today, but I think that um, that's what it's going to take. We're going to have to do a lot of this for them because um, frankly, the, the Board of Health and Health Department is in, a, in an adversarial position with a lot of the business owners downtown and um, or they're just exhausted by us. And I, and, and I understand completely. So we have to somehow make it clear to people, this is an investment in infrastructure that we're trying to deal with the future. This is not, oh, our rates are falling, and oh, by the way, we want you to spend hundreds of dollars on HEPA filters. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that it's highly likely that we will have other epidemics of respiratory illness. Surely we'll have um, epidemics of flu. We always do. We might have, uh, new coronavirus outbreaks. So we're not talking about doing something about COVID now. We're talking about 
investing in the future so that we don't have to necessarily go through such measures again in the future. So I, I think there's, there's a discussion we have to have and there is a way to support assessment and intervention in a way we have never done before. And we currently don't have resources to do this. And I know that um, a number of us have spoken to, to the um, mayor's uh, listening sessions about ARPA money. And, and I was really thrilled to hear that there's $4 million set aside for, for COVID just in general, not necessarily for ventilation systems or air filtration. But I think there's a real possibility if, if we um, made the case for specific infrastructure um, investments like this that would make it easier in the future, that we could make that argument. But I, I don't have a lot of hope of just putting something out there and expecting businesses to pick up on it. I, I think that's too much to ask. So we've talked about this a little bit in our little um, task force. Um, and um, one thing we talked about was for the restaurant inspectors to be educated on this and talk about it when they do their inspections that go twice a year. So starting sometime soon, we could educate them about that. They can bring a device that measures their their length and width and, you know, so give them their data on how big their restaurant is and talk about what the possibilities are. We'll send them out that uh, sheet of, you know, that flow sheet of the, if you have central air, here are your possibilities. You don't have central air, here are your possibilities. So just start that educational process. Um, Rick, who is the other uh, uh, member of the task force is a professor at UMass and he thought that this would be a great project for an epidemiology student. And he is going to work on uh, enlisting some or, or figuring out how to enlist uh, students who could go around to restaurants or make dates with uh, restaurants and, and teach them about this and encourage them to do that. So that would be a service that they might provide. Those are the two things we came up with for sort of immediate intervention. Um, obviously, we're talking about the ARPA money. Um, it sounds like the city is very uh, open to this. A number of us went to those uh, sessions. Uh, Josh went to a different one, and Cynthia um, was at one. And um, I think it's on um, the radar of a lot of the ARPA commissioners. Um, they are still trying to figure out how they're going to request. We're going to have to submit a grant application and whether every business is going to have to submit their own little application or are they going to submit it to some central place? Is it going to be based in the chamber? Is it going to be based in the Department of Health? Um, yeah, I can exactly clarify. how that's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I can clarify that final point about business submissions. Uh, so when I went to a listening session and asked the panel about this, uh, they supported having a single grant applicant that would then be in charge of distributing a pot of money to businesses rather than having every individual business submit a separate application. They said that would make their lives a lot easier. So that point, I think the board, um, my, my understanding is that the board is, is supports a single applicant process. Yeah. So we'll see how it finally shakes out. Um, Dallas? Yeah, just thinking about partnerships too and, and <clears throat> how we might want to motivate individuals and business owners specifically. I wonder if maybe there's a, you know, this, this could be also a project for some type of financial or MBA student too, um, or someone to also think about the cost component, but then really what you save as a business owner, if you think about the reduced revenue that would happen if there was another outbreak or you had to either close down the business or there was fear of going into the business, it, it really can take a, a, a business could take a substantial hit, right? And if that is communicated in business terms too, then there might be, um, you know, some good incentive to change for those who might be more financially motivated. Yeah, I think the question remains that if we have another wave, I'm sure we're going to have another wave, but particularly in the winter when people would want to dine in, um, 
how much ventilation would change people's minds about going to an indoor restaurant. I mean, it doesn't decrease transmission 100%. It decreases transmission 30%. I think that's significant, but it's it's still relative. I, 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 I do think, though, that it's still a, a potential, for lack of a better word, selling point for a business to say we do have this, though. These are added protective measures that exist here. So there would be some perhaps... If that happened, you could see some businesses doing better because they have that, because people might feel safer. I think that's a, a great idea, um, if only to allow businesses to understand that we're not clueless about their issues and their world. We come at them with health, ish, health problems and health interventions, and I think sometimes they think that we're not understanding of what they have to deal with. And I, Joanne, I think it's a great idea what you, you laid out for um, perhaps the um, restaurant inspections to include uh, and all that. I don't think we're just talking about restaurants though. And I think we're talking about other buildings that are not necessarily inspected on a regular basis by the health department. And I think we need to think about and talk about what that includes what criteria there might be, um, how much people are spending enough time, in what spaces are people spending enough time where, where transmission could happen, and when is this really not an exposure? Um, I think that those are measures we have to, have to think about, but I think of it more than just bars and restaurants. Um, I think it's broader than that. And then, of course, the more you broaden it, the less money you have available for each individual unit. I agree. I mean, I was originally focusing on bars and restaurants and maybe gyms because those are known to be high risk places for COVID transmission. Uh, but when we went to that listening session, someone brought up uh, home daycares. And I thought that was a great example. Likely, you know, New England, we have a lot of old homes that don't have any um, air systems in place. Um, and those are potential places of transmission. But, but truth be told, the transmission among toddlers is more likely, you know, saliva on each other, <laughs> things like that, you know, um, less likely airborne and more likely more direct. But, uh, but the idea of, of what other kinds of businesses should be included, I'd also like to include any municipal buildings, you know, um, uh, particularly where the public are involved. Um, but I think that's a really good question. I also think we might have to make some tough decisions about who would not be eligible. For example, should we allow um, for-profit nursing homes to be eligible for this, or should we have an expectation that they would do this themselves? We can offer advice, we can offer information, but would we support equipment for large locations like that? Um, understanding that there's a risk of transmission within those walls, but is that what we're talking about here? I'm wondering if they have any regulations already about air quality. I don't even know. And I'd like to add, I reached out to the mayor's office because I wanted a little more clarification on um, multiple businesses versus a group of businesses. And it was shared with me um, kind of for the reason you guys just brought up to have one, one um, like us to partner with one person or like, a, uh, what do I say? Nonprofit organization mm -hmm. so that we wouldn't be making those decisions as a, a board of health um, to who the money goes to and who it doesn't for, for one reason, that would be really important. And also so they could reach out to and, and kind of serve the, a group of businesses versus each business going to them. That was, it was highly recommended doing that. I'm not sure what entity encompasses all these different kinds of businesses, except for the government. Yeah. Um, um, it, it, first, it, yeah. It's hard. First thoughts was the Downtown Business Association. You know, um, right, but that doesn't encompass all, right. the, all that we're talking about. I mean, there are no easy answers for this. Um, you know, whenever people come, great idea, yeah, buts. 
there, there are a bunch of yeah buts associated with this. It, it's a tough, but I also think, I don't want to lose sight of how exciting this is. First of all, to have gotten to a place where this is what we're talking about, not vaccine cards, and um, that we're talking about a way to actually help um, with um, knowledge and consultation and um, resources. That's not been a, I can't ever remember that happening in 14, or, or has it been 140 years that I've been on the Board of Health? Um, but I don't ever remember us being in this situation. So it, it's, we have this period of, we have an opportunity of relative calm to be able to even think about something um, that's so different and potentially so groundbreaking. And I, I think people will like this uh, in general, there'll, there'll be some issues I'm sure that will come up, but in, in, in general, I think that this, this will go over very well. And I'm very excited about this opportunity. Thanks for all of you who have done all this work so far. You're welcome. It's been fun. Is the science, is the science strong enough to say something like total hypothetical? if COVID came back full force and we instituted the indoor mass mandate that we could say, if you have a certain amount of purifiers, units, whatever, you do not have to uh, adhere to the indoor mass mandate. I don't think we know that. No, okay. I think I, I think it's uh, the, the measures are additive, if not multiplicative. I, I don't think yeah. anyone is in a position of advocating if you do this measure alone, mm -hmm. you, uh, you, you've got it. It's, so this, this is really more for helping the public to feel safe. Safer. Well, to, safer. Yeah, to get back to sort of yeah. normal where people can yeah. go indoors. Uh, uh, so the reason I was focusing on bars and restaurants because those are places you can't mask. Right, you can't mask yeah. while you're eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but but for transmission in any indoor space, you have to deal with droplet, which is the person-to-person -person contact. And that's what the mask is good for, versus the airborne, which is sort of the total indoor space. I think that a lot of people are under the perception that uh, if they sit indoors more than six feet away from someone, then they're fine, and it's not true. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, just because you filter the air doesn't mean you're not still going to have that direct transmission, unfortunately. I, I apologize to everyone. I would love to continue in this uh, very interesting conversation, but I have another commitment that I have to get to. So um, I'll have to sign off. This is great. Very exciting Thank stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I kind of want to add to that, that the part of um, myself being educated in it is um, there's certainly lots of reasons that uh, COVID kind of brought healthy buildings to everybody's awareness, but it, it, knowing now the simple ways, I think helping people answer those questions, it's, it's about some layers of prevention, but it's just about the awareness of healthy buildings are better for us. Yeah, I mean, we didn't we didn't get into that quite so much. I mean, the thing is that depending on your type of ventilation, it works on different things. For example, um, some of the experts in healthy buildings are really focused on CO2. When you have a lot of like, CO2 comes from people's breath. When you have a lot of people in a space, CO2 levels go up and they say it decreases attention. People get sleepy, they get headaches and this and that. And that's a reason to increase your ventilation. But that's different from viral particles. Viral particles, you can uh, filter out with HEPA filters, but that's not gonna do anything for your CO2. So there are little differences in what you're trying to aim for as in, and what you can achieve. I just think I it's a great awareness as to start talking about it. Yeah. Does anybody have any other thoughts about where we can bring this education since this is how we're gonna start? 
And I'm just wondering, because I know you wanted to have an audience of city officials, but if there was any way, you know, city council meeting, it could be on the agenda or city meetings or whatever, um, because a wide distribution of, of this would, would, I think, be re very effective. So, okay. so what I thought we would do is actually Josh and I and Amy made a recording of this um, already um, that's not embedded in our recording of our meeting. And so now it's uh, it's on the cloud and it's a link that uh, we could send around. So Amy, would you be comfortable um, emailing this to the mayor, city councilors and the ARPA counselors, ARPA, ARPA commissioners, I think they're called. I will. Great. I also wonder about the Northampton Chamber of Commerce too. I know they meet regularly. Yep. They've got a series called like Lunch and Learn or something like that. And Link and Learn. Uh, Link and Learn. Link and, learn. Um, and uh, we've already, so we have a connection with Amy K. Helene, who is, uh, works, uh, she's from the Downtown Business Association, not the yes. chamber though, right? Yep, too different. Yep. Um, she got the feedback from the restaurants that they would really like to wait till September because they are really busy right now, short staffed and serving outside. Um, so we're happy to get on chamber and downtown business association agendas whenever they want us. I'm just thinking, should we join the like Rotary Club or uh, like I don't know where where what other groups exist that might want to have us? Um, we could put it on our website, right? Health department oh, website, definitely on our website. Yeah, but I don't think too many people go there looking for it. So we could. Put we out could press release Can you, about it we could put it on um northampton public tv no problem but i think wherever we put it i would like if you guys could craft some type of introduction um telling you know explaining what this is and what it's about so we can attach the video to it a written introduction or are you talking about a video introduction a written introduction for for where we're gonna send it electronically, but we could do a video introduction too for where we're gonna, you know, if we wanna put in um, Northampton public access or what have you okay. on the, on the uh, city webpage, our webpage. How about we write an article for the Gazette talking about the fact that this exists and um, including the URL or how to find the URL? That's excellent, excellent idea. Any other ideas? I, I just, in that article to the Gazette, I might consider framing this also as a, a business investment too. Mm -hmm. Any volunteers for drafting that? I mean, I am happy to draft it. I've been a Josh comes through again. For a decade, Josh is so. amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Josh, um, did I mention we have a vacant Board of Health member seat? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's enticing, you know. I, I think that if I had like a little bit more time. Uh, <laughs> um. Well, that's awesome. So we will plow through working on um, how to get this out there, see if we can find some students to actually go to businesses and educate. We'll work with Amy on educating the inspectors so we can include at least some discussion of this and education in the inspection process. Um, that's a good start. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks so so much, Josh. I can't remember if we do we have a meeting date, uh, follow up meeting date. Mm -mm. So maybe no, we could put. So we should get on that. <laughs> yeah. So Amy, would you put out a a couple of dates? It seems like Mondays have been good for everybody, right? Yep. Awesome. Thanks so much, Josh. Absolutely happy to. <laughs> um, I think we have one more Thank you, agenda Josh. item. Uh, I think our last agenda item is just to talk about the uh, board vacancies. Meredith, do you want to say where we are now? 
Um, well, it's on the website that we do have a vacancy. We've received one new applicant and I've asked um, to review the applications the last time we had a vacancy. And again, this is an appointment by the mayor, not us. So you make recommendations, Meredith, or you? Review? I did with our previous mayor. I'm not sure about the new mayor. Okay. So if anybody knows of anyone who might be interested, you might mention that. Um, maybe we could put that in our Gazette article. Oh, by the way. <laughs> and if I could um, just make a pitch for, um, I'm on this select committee now, which I've got to go to at seven o'clock, um, about why it is very difficult to get people on boards. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that and to get a good representation of citizens, uh, residents. Um, so um, I think it, I think there was an article in the Gazette that Amherst is having the same type of problem because of time commitments, young parents with children, work conflict, you know. And so um, I just hope we can get a good um, crop of applicants that are willing to serve. Um, so just just want you to know that we're working on ways to sort smooth the process, streamline the process. All right. Um, so I have misplaced my notes from the last meeting. Did we pick, I think we did pick dates for July. Does anybody remember? I believe we did. Uh, so our normal meeting would be the 21st. Was that still good with everyone? Um, I will probably be on vacation, just, just, but I might be able to dial in. No. I have a meeting in my calendar for July 28th. I don't yeah. know. For us? Yeah, that's I do my calendar. I do too, Dallas. Okay. So we so we had already switched it. Okay, that's fine. I think maybe Suzanne couldn't do it that 21st either. So okay. So July 28th. Um and, and then August I think. Yeah, we had an August meeting too. Yeah, August 18th. Okay, that was the one that was standing. That's our usual time. So we'll keep those. Uh, depending on what's going on, we may um, cancel the August meeting if there's nothing big on the agenda. Um, but I think for now, we'll keep the July meeting. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. So next meeting is, what did we say, July 28th? Yes. Okay. Any other comments? Would someone like to make a motion? A motion to close the meeting. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Comments? All in favor? Tell us. Aye. So, uh, Cynthia? Uh, yes. Joanne, yes. Thank you all.